Hello, this is Dale. I'm here with Persevere to Excel podcast. I am super excited. I'm actually remote today. I'm at someone's house. I'm here with Steve Reno, and I'm super excited for our conversation today. Hello, Steve. How are you doing today? I'm fine, Dale. Thank you. I am super excited to be out here. I've actually got out of the living room space where I usually do the podcast and I'm here at your house. This is exciting. Welcome. Good to have you here. For sure. Thank you so much. Um, Steve, this time of the year is like, you know, there, there's a lot of mix, you know, you know, we just celebrated Valentine's Day last week. You know, the weather in New Hampshire tends to go back and forth. This time, this time is usually like prime time in terms of the coldness. Um, how do you feel about like New Hampshire weather in February? Well, the first thing I have to admit is to come clean, and that is I'm a native Californian, Dale. Oh. <laughs> I'm uh, third generation, and so I, I did not grow up in this kind of weather. In fact, I'm told that uh, in 1949, when I was uh, five years old, it snowed. And uh, first time in California, Southern California, I guess in almost a century. So uh, I only saw snow really that one time. And then once in a while, we get up into the Sierra and see snow. So um, I look out the window and it's beginning to snow right now. And it doesn't do for me as it does for a lot of New England people. <laughs> I just assume it'd be sunny. No, for sure. You know, and, and you know, I'm, I'm originally from Africa. So, um, but I've been in New Hampshire for 20 years. And every time we get to this time of the year, especially in February, I'm just like, man, I got to find a warmer place. But I do have to say there, there's other amazing stuff about being in New Hampshire. So I'm super grateful for being here. Well, I love New Hampshire. I really do. In fact, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been our home now for 20 years. And uh, we lived in Maine before moving to Oregon. And so, and my wife's a New Englander. So here we are. And we love it. We really do. But I like it better in the spring, summer, and fall. For sure. For sh- Spring is actually, spring and early fall is my favorite time yep. of the year Beautiful. here. For sure. Um, so Steve, I actually met Steve through uh, Leadership New Hampshire. I was part of Leadership New Hampshire 2017 um, class. And for you guys who are not familiar with Leadership New Hampshire, is it's a, it's almost a year-long program where different folks from different industries that are leaders, they come together and learn about the state. And um, that's how I got that's how I got to know Steve. Steve is actually the direct, the executive director for Leadership New Hampshire, and um, I've I've admired Steve, and I've I've been so inspired by just the way he he um, operates and how he presents himself. So um, I was super super excited when I reached out to Steve and I said, Steve, you got to be in my podcast. And he was like, Dale, sign me in. So I'm super pumped to have you here, um, Steve. I would love to have you just explain a little bit about who you are, a little bit of your background, so my listeners can get to know you a little bit. Well, as I said, uh, oh, first of all, Dale, thank you for including me on this. I've listened to a couple of your podcasts, and I'm honored to be to be uh, to be in that number, and hope I can offer something useful. I, um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I was born in California. I uh, was educated in in California. Uh, I went on to after I got my doctorate, I went on to teach at a British university for um, for almost ten years. Uh, then moved back to the United States. I, I was married, married a, a young woman from uh, from Boston. We moved back to the United States, and uh, I've made my career here in uh, in the states since uh, since 1980. We um, we lived in Maine for uh, almost 10 years. Then we moved to Oregon for uh, for almost 10 years, and then we've been here now for almost 20 years. So that gives you an idea of uh, of my career. I served um, until 2010 as the, uh, as the chancellor of the University System of New Hampshire. And um, after that was, uh, was over, I um, retired from that. I went down to, uh, to, to Harvard, my field's religion, comparative religion. And I was a visiting fellow there for a year. And during that time, the folks at Leadership New Hampshire approached me and said, would you be interested? I knew the program. And I uh, loved the program. In fact, I had spoken to the classes on many, many occasions each, uh, each year on Education Day. And so um, I joined LNH. Uh, class of 2011 was the first class, and I'm now in the 10th class. Wow, that's incredible. Just love it. <laughs> um, I am curious to know, Steve, what 
what was the, kind of the deciding factor that drew you into saying, man, this is something that I would like to be involved with? Because like, as you say, you retired from, you know, very substantial uh, roles that you had in, in higher education uh, in, in order for you to, to say, man, this is something I want to get involved with, especially where it's, it's a little bit different. This is a different kind of occasion than what you were um, previously involved with. That's a really good that's a really good question. I, as I as I think back over my uh, my career, Deo, um, I, I I I may have shared this with the class. Um, I after I graduated from high school, I I really thought, having been raised in a very Catholic community, uh, had a I had an aunt that went on to become a nun, that uh, that I had a vocation to the priesthood. So um, in those days, to become a priest, it was an eight-year program. And I went into that program, and I was there for five years. And during that time, I decided not to continue. But as I think back on that, um, I, was, I was really brought up in a religious community that um, was emphasized greatly the importance of giving to community, serving community. And I saw... The potential for that in the role of a of a priest, and then when I decided that that was not the uh, the, the role for me, uh, in part I would say because I didn't really want to be celibate for the rest of my life, <laughs> I, uh, I I went in and I I had always enjoyed teaching, and so I went into to, to the professoriate, and uh, there again I I felt that the the role of a professor was not just to impart knowledge, but to help people uh, of all ages uh, see a responsibility to their communities. Mm. And um, that, that was very much a, a, an emphasis of mine. I went on, at, at one point I was a university president, and that was a real opportunity there to, to carry that message out into the campus community and among the faculty and so on. And then uh, as a university system, I saw all four of our campuses as uh, places where we prepared people to, to serve the state of New Hampshire and beyond. And so that kind of commitment fit very, very nicely with what I understood Leadership New Hampshire to be. Mm. Um, if I'm going on here too long, just stop No, me. you're but, good. But Leadership New Hampshire was uh, an outgrowth of a gubernatorial commission that was set up in the early 90s by then Governor Judd Gregg. And um, he commissioned a group of almost 30 people to ask um, really a set of three questions. What kind of state is New Hampshire today? Mm. What kind of state would we like New Hampshire to be? And what steps do we need to take to realize that vision? And um, I, I'm fascinated by that exercise because it, the work of the commission took place over probably a good 18 months. It was before the internet. Wow. It was in the days when uh, there were probably something like 30 newspapers in New Hampshire. And the commission met all over the state in, with focus groups. It put surveys in the um, in newspapers. Um, and it took testimony from people all over the state in response to those three questions. And without going into all the details, we can talk more about that later on. But one of the recommendations of the commission at the end of the day was there should be a program that takes people who have demonstrated a commitment to their communities or their regions, who want to know more about the state, who want to know more about its issues, its problems, its challenges, so that they could be better engaged. And that really twigged for me. That, that linked up with what I felt had been my kind of professional value throughout my career of giving to the community, giving back to the community through education. Mm -hmm. And so when Leadership New Hampshire, um, when I first came here in 2000, I was asked to serve on the board of LNH, and I could see it from the inside. Uh, I was speaking to the class every year on Education Day, so I saw it from that point of view. Mm. I sponsored people to go through the program, so I saw it from that point of view. So by the time someone came to me and said, hey, would you like to do this? I figured, well, I know the state of New Hampshire. Um, I've got a pretty good network. 
why don't I try to parlay that into something that will serve an organization, the purpose of which is to build a community of informed and engaged leaders. And so I guess I'm saying, for me, it was a natural fit. Wow. I love it. So it, that, that's incredible. You, you had so many different touch points within how you were involved. And when the opportunity came up, it was almost like that was the last thing in terms of what you need to get in, how you can get involved with. And um, I just want to say it's, 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 it's an amazing blessing and super amazing privilege for, for us as a state to have you as um, the leader of Leadership New Hampshire. I, I do want to go back to something um, that you mentioned earlier in terms of kind of your your trajectory, right? The pathway that you 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 were you took from high school on, and that's something that actually resonated to me a lot. I I don't I don't even know if you know this. So during leadership New Hampshire, um, during my class, you told you told that story. You told the story how you were on this path to to become a priest, and um, I think it was five years in, right? Yeah, five, yeah, years, five years in, in. of an eight year program. Um, you decided that this was this wasn't the pathway that you wanted to take, and to me, when I when I heard that, I don't know, it just like res- it, it 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 impacted me in a way because I was like, man, like you were committed, you committed five years of your life to this to this pathway to this journey, and and then you 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 made that shift, you made the shift, something occurred that uh, allowed you to make that shift, and I'm just I'm just. I would love to, to kind of hear you unpack that a little bit, you know, in terms of, you know, prior to going into that pathway of becoming a priest, um, you know, what, what was your commitment like knowing that it was going to be such a long process? Um, so that's the first part of my question. And I have a bunch of follow up questions after that. Well, I think it's important uh, to for me to cast back to that time. Uh, as I said earlier, um, you know, I grew up in a in a very uh, traditional Catholic family. Um, and uh, as I say, I had an aunt who went into the convent. And she was a really nifty aunt. I loved her very much. We, she taught me how to play tennis, how to play baseball. Um, and I was, you know, I was a little kid when she went into the convent. And I remember thinking, wow, why is she doing that? And she sat me down one day and she, and she told me. She said that she felt called, mm. a vocation. And uh, she said to me, and, you know, maybe you might get a vocation. Oh, maybe wow. Not. So she put a little bug in there. Yeah, a little she bit. did. She put a bug <laughs> in my ear. And, of course, you know, I, I grew up, you know, in a parish, and I was an altar boy. And, and I have to tell you, Dave, I was really lucky because I met some really wonderful priests. And notwithstanding all the stuff that we've heard recently, I never had any bad in, uh, experiences or anything like that. The guys I knew who in the, in the priesthood were just really wonderful people. And, you know, they never, they never pushed me, they never nudged me, but they were there as a kind of a role model. And I thought, gosh, you know, they're doing good things. And so at a certain point, I, I was toying between whether to go on and go to college and do, do pre-law, mm-hmm. because I was really fascinated by, I'd watched too many Perry Mason programs, I suppose, <laughs> and, um, and going into the seminary. So I went in the seminary. And I, I did so because I felt I had a vocation. And um, you need that. I mean, at least I did, because it's not an easy life. I mean, my gosh, you know, we were going to, I mean, it was like, they don't do it anymore like this, but in those days, you know, you went into the seminary in the fall, you got home for a day at Thanksgiving, you got home for a week at Christmas, and then you didn't get home for a week until Easter, and then you had summers off, but all the rest of the time, you were in a, like in a monastery. I mean, you got up at 5.30 5.30 in the morning, you were in bed by 10 o'clock at night. You know, I took 22 credits a semester. Um, we, you know, we worked, we worked hard and prayed hard and, and um, you know, played sports and all that. I mean, and so you needed, you needed that incentive to, to stay with it for eight years. But then even after eight years, you knew that you were going to be living a, a celibate life. Right. And... Um, you know, you wouldn't have kids, you wouldn't have a spouse, all that kind of stuff. And so at a certain point, I, I realized that this was not for me. And that was a very, very, very tough decision because I'd invested five years. Uh, my family had great hopes. 
Um, and so probably the hardest thing was breaking it to my grandmother that mm. I wasn't going to be, <laughs> wasn't going to be a priest. And, uh, but she took it well. My, my folks took it well. And, um, you know, I went on and did, did other things. So, sorry to cut you off, but I, I wanted to, to ask you this question. Um, so when you, cause a, a lot of my listener and a lot of people that I get to work with at times, um, you know, life decisions sometimes are not part of, it, you know, sometimes it's, 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 it's the conditions that, that are thrown at them that they can't control that, that kind of shifts where they go and how they operate. And, and, and for you, in this case, it was something that you internal, internally had to kind of um, come to a realization that this wasn't going to be a pathway for you to continue on. I am very curious to know how long did it take before you felt that, man, this, this is actually not the pathway that I'm going to continue on. Well, I would say that I thought about it every morning at about five thirty. <laughs> wow! When the bell rang, and I and I had to, get, to get up, <laughs> drag and... myself out of bed, thinking, you know, what in the world? But I, I, I would I would say that in some sense, Dale, if if some external um, factor had played in, it might have been easier. Mm. In other words, if if the folks in the seminary had called me in one day and said, you know, Steve, we don't think you're cut out for this. Well, that would have been easier, I suppose. But it wasn't that way. They, they did nothing to discourage me. In fact, they were encouraging me. Mm. And, um, but, you know, I was in a class with 125 guys. And, you know, we would, we would talk about how we felt about what we were doing. Not all the time, but enough. And so there was a lot of self-reflection. Uh, but I would say that um, there was a an expectation that I had, I think we all had at that time, that uh, a priest occupied a certain place in a, in a community, and it was a place of responsibility. It was a place uh, where you were um, a role model in some sense. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you, you were really cautioned not to take yourself too seriously, not to let your ego think that you're better than anybody else. You're just doing something different. So you have to be humble. Yep. And one of the hardest things is to be humble. And especially if you're in a role that at that time, and now we're talking about the 50s and 60s, where you know a priest was on a pedestal. Things are different today, but in any case. So I would say that it was, it took me probably two full years, if not almost three, gradually to come to the realization that this is really not what I am meant to do. I never got Lord whispering in my ear saying, Psst, time to get out. I never had anybody tell me it was time to go. It just was a gradual realization that I should be doing something else. But I never, ever, ever, then or now, have felt that those five years were wasted. They were years of discipline. They were years of great friendships. They were years of great education, really good education. And um, a lot of those habits have stayed with me a long time. Wow, thank you for sharing that. And, and when you made that transition, um, what was like the wait period before you took that next pathway in terms of where you wanted to go after that? Well, that's really an interesting question that kind of applies to later on in my life too. And this is maybe the one bit of advice I, I, I am inclined to give to people now when they retire from a job or, or they're about to change a job or so on. And uh, my advice is put yourself in neutral for a period of time. Mm. Give yourself a chance to decompress from what you were doing. And in that case, um, I didn't really take my own advice. Um, I left the seminary in August of, uh, of 1966, and um, I uh, enrolled at the University of California, Santa Barbara, in the, in the fall in a, in a PhD program. And uh, that was a huge adjustment. I mean, going from a, a sheltered monastic community <laughs> into a UC campus. The whole world just opened up. Well, the whole world <laughs> opened up. I mean, the Vietnam War was full blast, the anti-war demonstrations. The students burned the Bank of America. A student was shot and killed on campus. There were riots. Uh, Ronald Reagan was governor. 
We had 4,000 National Guardsmen on campus. I had a brick thrown through a classroom window. Um, it was not the monastic environment I had lived in before. It was very different. That was a big adjustment. And so, so you, so you got out, and all of a sudden, in the middle of that, it's almost the citizen autonomy and ownership at a different level than you know than America has seen in other times in terms of people actually, you know, being able to voice their opinion, and and the media's even the media was changing at that time, right? In terms of radio and TV and everything, everything was changing. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, it was just as if I'd been in a time capsule for five years and then simply came out of it and wow, what's going on here? How, how and, did that impact how you were grounded, right? Because you, you, you said that there was a lot of stuff that you took out from that five years of being in the program um, that really impacted you positively or informed who you were. And then now, you, now you're open, I would say, to the wild, wild west to a certain extent. How, how did that impact, like, what you were grounded on, and what grounded you? Well, it was a real test, to be honest with you. I mean, I moved, to, I moved to an apartment in Isla Vista, which is the student community right next to the campus. And uh, to put it mildly, Isla Vista was a pretty wild place in the 60s. It really was. And um, I had an apartment right across the street from a fraternity. And so, um, you know, it was, it was hard to even sleep at night, believe me. I would say, though, that the thing that really grounded me more than anything else were my friendships. Mm. I, uh, I had friends who had, uh, had left the seminary, who uh, we stayed in touch, and they had gone through similar sorts of reentry, so to speak. Um, I had uh, friends I made among the professors who were, who were just terrific at Santa Barbara at the time. And, um, and my own... You know, my own study habits, I suppose, helped me get through. And uh, I had some just some wonderful students in, in, the, in the classes that I took, as well as uh, later on some of the classes I taught. But it was a real time of adjustment. It, it really was. Um, finding my own voice and being having the confidence to, to express my views on, on political matters uh, was, was really... A liberating experience, uh, one that I had had to more or less muffle a little bit when I was in the seminary, because mm. in those days at least, um, questioning and dissent were not encouraged. How how engaged were you within the school community? Were you part of like clubs and different organizations, or I'm, I'm just curious in terms of um, your engagement early on. Well, I, we were, I was one of three doctoral graduate students and the first ones in, in the whole department. Um, and so uh, we had a pretty, pretty small club of the three of us, and we hung out a lot. And then in the second year, a couple more people joined the program. So I was, I was with them a lot. Uh, I had friends um, among the campus community, other graduate students, and so on. Uh, there was a, a very lively arts community uh, on the campus, and so uh, you know we were in. We had a lot of a lot of films and plays and music, and of course a lot of folk music at that time. And uh, so I had a lot of a lot of friends uh, there. Um, I also was part of the anti-war uh, demonstrations. In fact, I was in Santa Barbara not too long ago for a meeting, and I happened to be walking up State Street. And I happened to pass the, the building that's now called the Hotel Santa Barbara. And I just happened to glance up and I realized that in the 60s, I had been in that very same spot looking up and some agency, the FBI or somebody, was up there <laughs> videotaping uh, our, our demonstration. Oh, wow. I was never arrested, but uh, carried placards and, and all that sort of thing. I remember exactly where I was in Isla Vista when LBJ announced that he was not going to run for re-election, and literally, you could hear cheers all over Isla Vista at the at the time. But I think at that time, I was I was hovering between conservatism and and progressivism. I had grown up in a in a Republican family, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the first things I remember as a kid, I had an "I like Ike" sticker on my bicycle. I didn't know who the heck Ike was, but <laughs> I had one. And then that was a time where I think. I became, you know, more uh, more moving toward uh, a progressive view of politics, and but I think I I still maintain a 
a middle of the road in, in that regard. And, and of course, now in the work I do, I'm absolutely committed to finding common ground between people of opposing views. No, thank you for sharing that. I, I am curious to know about, you know, you finish, so you finish your PhD program, um, you become a teacher. H how, was, how was that experience? Now, now you get to, to lead. You know, it, it's different than if you were, you know, going to become a priest, but it's kind of still similar because you have this group of students that are uh, kind of seeking you in terms of the, the knowledge that you're presenting. Um, what was that like? What was that experience like for you? Well, I would say I got my first experience teaching when I was in high school and uh, the, the, the parish pastor invited me to, to teach uh, a catechism class on Saturday. Catechism, I think they now call it a, a CCD. CCD class. Yeah, CCD classes. And so I was teaching a CCD class to probably kids who were eighth graders, ninth graders maybe. And um, that, that was really fascinating because... I, I really loved trying to take an abstract concept and use analogies to explain it so that people could understand it. Um, and and that, was, that was fascinating. And, and it was very gratifying when you would see somebody go, oh, I get that. Oh, that's I cool. I understand that. <laughs> that's cool. So then when I went into, um, into the seminary, I had more opportunity to do that kind of CCD stuff. And then... When I was a, a graduate student, of course, I became a TA. And, um, you know, my job was to attend lectures given by a full prof and then to, uh, to take small discussion groups. And again, I was really intrigued and, and, and enjoyed having the experience of watching, of, of explaining some, some Hindu or Buddhist concept to Western kids. And they would go, oh, I see that. Oh, I hadn't thought about it that way. That was empowering. But it also carried with it a responsibility that you had to really know your stuff because they didn't know if you didn't know something. Oh, wow, right. And you could fake it. And I will admit that sometimes I might have been only two chapters ahead of the students, <laughs> but I had to be two chapters ahead of the students. And then, of course, later on, when you have your own class, um, you you know that sense of responsibility and professional integrity really hits you hard, especially when ch students will challenge you, and did, they should. Did you find, you know, the the idea of being humble and you know, kind of the selfless model of being a priest? Did you find that that influence how you? presented yourself as a teacher because you because you just admitted that you know it was important for you to make sure that you knew your stuff as you were teaching the students and I'm curious to know um, how much of how much of that influenced you know because you were working very hard as, a, as a, to get your PhD and you got it and that's a very you know highly uh, regard you know, accolades that you can um, gain and, and, and earn and I'm just curious from a professor standpoint, how, how, how did that play out in terms of how you viewed and viewed yourself and how you saw yourself and how that showed up when you engage with your, your teachers and professors, your, your, your students? Well, I think it had a lot to do with my background and then the subject area I chose, okay. comparative religion. Um, I, I believe then and I believe now that I don't think you can ever be an expert in, in world religion because there is simply so much to know. And there's so many variations within traditions and within religious communities. And so there's always, I'm always, always learning. And I think that there's a, um, I, I, I guess humility is the right word, but mm. I think maybe a, a, a sort of a realism about that, that you, um, you, know, you, only, you only have a grasp of a certain part of the elephant. <laughs> and, and if you think that, you know, you know the old metaphor of the people grasping, blind people grasping an elephant. You know, someone grabs the trunk and says an elephant is like a hose. Someone grabs a a, a leg and said an elephant is like a tree. Mm. Someone grabs an an ear and says an elephant is like a leaf. Someone grabs a tail and says an elephant is like a rope. Well, they're all right from what they're holding, but they're not. They don't have the whole picture. Right. And I think that that kind of realization that um, you are imparting the best you can 
that uh, there's always more to learn is, um, is important to have as a, as a teacher, but it's also important to impart to the people you work with, your students, so that they will remain open to, to new knowledge and to new discoveries and to new, and to new insights. Thank you for sharing that. And and one of the thing that I've I've seen in terms of you know growing up in in the Congo where I was born and raised, where um, we e- even in a very young age, you know, learning about other culture, especially Western culture, was like infused at an early age because we knew how much that impacted um, our lives, even though we were you know miles and miles away. But something that I found unique was when I moved to the states. Um, there was this like huge discrepancy and huge gap in terms of how um, students and my my people that I met here um, kind of related to you know other issues beyond their own. And one of the things that was fascinating to me when I was in high school, um, it became kind of the norm because I wasn't used to you know anything different in terms of how teachers presented information. But the most fascinating thing was when I actually went to college where. Even a lot of my college colleagues, there was such a big gap in terms of just their awareness around, um, even just their, their their ability to know that hey, you know, I don't know everything, right? Like it's not absolute how I see something, but more importantly, sometimes how professors presented information, um, they presented in a, such a narrow minded, and 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 that's when it clicked to me. I'm like, wow, it's how informations are presented. That's how, you know, when students are learning this information, they take it at face value without knowing that, hey, there might be other different lenses to see this issue or to see this topic. And in a lot of my world um, history classes or poli science classes that I took, I was a poli science major. Um, I, like I would bring in my my different point of views on stuff. And it was almost like, where, where did that come from? And if a teacher wasn't aware of that particular thing, it would always be, there would just be this vacuum where the rest of my, the, my, my classmates would be like, Dave, where did that come from? And I would have to expand on that and be like, well, technically when this happened, this actually occurred. And, that, and, and it sometimes teach, my teachers would be like, oh yeah, there, there is a, a different point of view on that. And I'm like, man, if teachers are, are not you know, transparent with students in terms of how information are being presented to them, um, especially when there's this absolutism sometimes in terms of our data is presented or information is presented, it completely shifts how people view things and it limits their ability to fully understand that, hey, there's so many different, you know, point of views on this and people are engaged and interact with in so many different ways. So um, I'm glad to hear that for, from you, you were able to have this kind of a neutral um, standpoint, you know, admitting that what you did know and what you didn't, what you didn't know. And unfortunately, um, I, I feel that in, in, in the way that education is presented in, in, in America, sometimes the teachers that we look up to, um, professors that we look up to, sometimes they have this very like absolute approach of, of presenting information that limits people's ability to, to understand that there's other you know, there's other lens, you know, and the other piece of it is too, even within American history, um, the narrative has been presented in such a one way that um, it prevents other folks to be able to understand the different lenses that other people have had. Um, so thank you. Thank you for, for being able to share that. I am curious to, to learn about how did you like what was your point of view in terms of your professional trajectory? And and I, I am curious because I, I view you as this very humble and um grounded person but you've been able to accomplish so much so i'm curious to know what were the things that that when that contributed to your to your trajectory well first of all i am i I really want to disagree with you on the humility piece (laughs) and um i i you know, the word hum- humility comes from the Latin word humus, which means earth. Mm. And um, I guess probably that's a good place to start because we're all human. Mm. <laughs> we're of the earth. If, if, you, if you take the Judeo-Christian scriptures, that's where we came from, dust. And, um, you know, so, so I, think that, I think it's important that we don't overemphasize our accomplishments. Um, we are, we are, we are so 
privileged, and I use that word now in with all the valences it carries. Right. We are privileged uh, by where we were born. We are privileged in in our in our socioeconomic background. All those kinds of things, and so. To, to, to turn around and look back on a career and say, you know, I've accomplished a great deal, you have to recognize where you were, what, I, at what place on the track your starting blocks were. Mm. Let's, just, let's just start there. Um, but I think that, you know, in terms of teaching, uh, Emerson said that great teaching begins with respect for the student. Mm. And I would say that great teaching, in fact, begins with a recognition that both the teacher and the student are students. The teacher is just a student who's further down the road. And um, that is really important because the road may be the one that the student is on. The student may come to you from a different road. And you need to be respectful of where she or he is coming from the experiences and the knowledge they're bringing with them. And you, you share what you know further down the road, further down the trail, um, because you've had the experience of that with them, but you have to do it in a way that is sensitive to who they are and how they see the world as they see it today. Um, you know, if I, if I were to walk into a, a, a a, a university or a college lecture room today. And of course, we don't have a lot of lecture rooms anymore, but anyway, you know what I mean, a seminar or whatever. Um, the, the students sitting around the table there, they're vastly different from the students that sat around the table in the 60s and 70s. They bring a whole different worldview. That's very true. Different experiences, backgrounds, expectations, prejudices, concerns technology, for heaven's sakes, into the room. And so, you know, I, I think that we have, to, we have to listen more as teachers as we speak, before we speak, really, uh, to, to understand who it is that we're talking with and recognize that, that it's a contract, it's a relationship we have with them. There are certain things that we have an obligation to provide them but on the other side, they have a certain responsibility to us too. And so it's a, it's a relationship. And like any relationship, you have to respect it and you have to nurture it. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, and, and I get the you know, opportunity to work with different schools at times, depending on what's going on. And it's very interesting at times when you give a student's opportunity to express um, what, their, what their feelings are. I was actually doing this recently last week. And it's always fascinating to know that, you know, there's not a lot of space for co-creation, even though both parties are involved in this environment. And, and, and most students, they spend most of their time, especially for K to 12, they spend more of their time at the school than anywhere else. And there's always that gap in terms of, you know, the transparency between um, teachers' ability to, li to fully listen, to give students a chance, but then vice versa, too. So it's always fascinating to see when those aha moments happens, when a teacher says something and a student's like, wow, that's, I didn't even know that was your perspective. Oh, vice versa. A student says something and a teacher looks over and says, oh, wow, I didn't even know that was. And so to me, I'm always saying, you know, you guys got to create a space where you're, 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 you're sharing, you're, you open a, a, a space where people can be transparent of what they're learning is and what, what does it look like to be part of this community which they spent so much of their time in. So I definitely agree with you in terms of, you know, the ability to listen, the, abil the ability to listen without, um, you know, objecting. You're listening fr from a neutral standpoint where you're, you're learning from both ends. Um, but you've said something really important, Dale, I want to follow up on, if I may, and that is if you are a teacher of the, it, it, the, the, that behaves in the way you've just described, you are serving as a model a role model for that student. Uh, I mean, think back in your, own, in your own life, and I can certainly think back in mine, to those teachers who, who did what you did. They listened, they encouraged, they were appreciative of, of, of what you had to say. And when, when a student observes that kind of experience, observes that kind of behavior, and experiences that kind of behavior, 
that becomes that becomes a paradigm. That becomes a model for them. It's a game changer. It's a game changer. And and the important thing is, and this relates back to a question you asked earlier about, you know, who were the who are the influences along the way? It was some of those really outstanding role models who were my teachers who who taught me facts, yes, who gave me information, yes, but who also taught me by the way they behaved. And um, I think back on those, and those were the ones who, even without saying it explicitly, were encouraging me to keep going, to reach higher, to try to get more. And, um, and that's so important, so valuable. And, and they stick with you forever. I mean, um, I can all go all the way back to, to second or third grade on in yeah. terms of teachers that I've had that have they've made an incredible impact on me and 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 it's it 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 it, it never leaves me and when i <laughs> it, it's it's incredible how um you know people can make such a positive impact in your life at that way and i write a lot of blogs and i've written about certain teachers that um that brought me in i remember one time i was in middle school and uh, for some reason i was in the el class so english is a learner classroom in this middle school it was very unfortunately it was super segregated in terms of you know, the experiences that EL students had in comparison to students, regular students, where EL students were, for the most part, stuck in the same classroom um, for the entire day. And we had opportunities to go to either a music class or gym. But outside of that, our other um, colleagues or other students in the school, they were able to, to jump around from a science class to a different class or social study class. But anyways, um, the band, the band teacher wasn't as inclusive to include EL students because she was afraid that it was going to slow down her her class. So, but the orchestra teacher, Ms. Suave, she she was open to taking EL students. And I remember being in her class, she uh, we were learning how to play the, the viola, violin, and, and the stand-up bass. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, I was playing the viola, and she said one time, she said, hey, I have this piece here. Um, I understand from where you guys came from, drums are a big thing. And um, we're like, yeah, we play the Congo, we play the bongo. And she said, I want to I want to um, include this in part of our performance. So she was able to find some bongos in Congo. It was I think it was four of us. And we would practice either during um, lunchtime or during orchestra time. And she fostered us for probably about i would say maybe three months or so and then when it was the big performance in spring we got to play an ensemble where we came out and played the bongos along with the orchestra and everybody was so blown away by that because it was how did that happen was this a partnership a relationship with the with the band and no this was miss swabi's being intentional and 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 considering us and getting to know us and figuring out what our interest were and giving us that platform i i even now it still it really impacts me because she went out of her way and um and so i've, I've had teachers have played such a such an incredible incredible role in my life growing up and um so that's why every time when i get opportunity to work with schools i'm always like man you guys could you can change a trajectory you can contribute to the trajectory of the students based on how you show up you know years ago dale i was in korea and my host uh, said to me, I'm not going to be with you tomorrow. I have a, a task I have to perform. So someone else is going to show you around. So that was fine. The next day, that's what happened. And the third day, my friend came back and uh, he said, uh, I was away yesterday. I had a task and I, I didn't ask anything. And he said, well, let me tell you what I did. He said, yesterday was the birthday of the Buddha. Oh. And he said, we have a custom where uh, during your lifetime, um, on, on the occasion of the birthday of the Buddha, you should take flowers to that teacher who was most influential in your life. Wow. And he said, and this was a full professor, he said, I took flowers to my, to my teacher who taught me when I was in grade school. Grade and, school, um, wow. I, I, I was so taken by that that a few years later, I took flowers to Father O'Sullivan, who was the principal of my high school. 
who was in his early 90s, and um, I made an appointment to see him, and I took him flowers, and we had tea, and I told him the story of my friend in Korea. And I have to say, Dale, he was so incredibly touched. That's awesome. But I have told that story to many people, and, and I say it to encourage, at some point when you get a chance, do something, even if it's just a phone call or a letter or a visit, but let that person or persons know what an influence they were on your, on your life. That's awesome. Well, Steve, I have two more questions for you. We can probably talk forever. Um, my first question to my two last questions is, so you've had this really awesome experience. You've, you, you get to engage with so many different folks. Um, and I'm curious to know, like, what, what grounds you today? You know, has, has it changed in terms of what grounded you before? Um, I'm curious to know from your, your perspective. Well, I, I took some advice years and years ago, and I guess it goes back to my seminary days, and that is that um, I think, for me, it is critical that every morning I have at least 10, 15, 20 minutes uh, where I'm by myself and I kind of have a period of reflection, meditation, whatever you want to call it. And um, to, to be grateful for the day, to think about what it is I can make of this day. I read a quote the other day that just really struck me in this regard. It said, a day wasted today is the tomorrow a person who died yesterday would love to have had. Wow. And so I use that morning period. Sometimes it's, it's a little reading that could be a prompt. Uh, sometimes it's something else. But it's, it's just a period of reflection. My late mother-in-law used to say, she'd do the same thing. She said, the first hour is the rudder of your day. Mm. It, 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 it sets your boat in the direction it's going to go. And I like that. Uh, and so what is it that grounds me? Well, I guess it's that. And the other are, are the relationships I have. I mean, I'm blessed with an outs- just a wonderful family, a, a dear wife of now 46 years, two children, two uh, son-in-law and a daughter-in-law, grandkids, friends. And, and these, are all, these are all things that, that make up the web of relationships in which I, I live. And that, to mix metaphors, that web grounds me. Thank you for sharing that. And my last question for you is um, my podcast is Persevere to Excel. And um, there's so many different ways that, you know, people persevere through things and hopefully it allows them to move forward. Right. A lot of my listeners, which I've, I've, I've actually spoken to a lot of my listener in terms of um, where they are, a lot of them. The, the life is, is such a fast pace. They're, 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 they're chasing that next thing. Either it might be internally, right, where they are mentally and what, you know, what they're prioritizing on, or it's externally in terms of jobs, career path, um, you know, doing something of their own. Should I stick around? How can I continue to move forward? Um, what would your, your, your word of advice or encouragement be for them regarding um, being able to persevere in order for them to excel. Well, you know the, the line from the song, um, slow down, you move too fast. Mm-hmm. You've got to make the morning last. Uh, again, back to what I said earlier, I think that um, especially in this fast-paced world where everything is instantaneous, everything is on demand, anything, everything is 24-7, we really have to create for ourselves uh, some kind of a, a governing mechanism on speed to allow us to pause and reflect. When I was a kid growing up, we had what was called the Angelus. It was a bell that was rung at six in the morning, six at noon, uh, 12 noon, and six at night. And it was a time when we paused for three minutes just to take a breath, to think about who we are, what we're doing, and why we're doing it. And... Um, I think that that helps give focus. 
um, because it causes us to reflect on what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. And sometimes when we have to do that, it may change our behavior. We may not rush around quite as fast. We may not try to cram too many things in at the expense of doing a few things better. We may not take advantage of people because we see what it is that we're doing. Um, so to persevere, I think you just keep working at it day over day over day. Well, thank you so much, Steve, for joining me today on my podcast. And this was awesome. I, we probably could have continued on for another five hours. Um, and I look forward to uh, maybe in the future to interview again. But this was awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you very much. <laughs>